as we stand here we declare that you alone are our god you alone are worthy of our worship god we are here because of the cross what would we be god without the saving grace of christ that was offered for us at the cross and was offered to us everyone who looks to you today are saved what a wonderful grace it is god we thank you for the cross we thank you for the nail pierced hands we thank you for the blood that was shed for us we are indebted to you god and our lives find meaning our lives find purpose in the light of christ thank you for that light that shined into our lives so we offer ourselves to you this morning god we offer everything that we have we recognize that comes from you and so we offer everything back to you our life included we belong to you god and so be glorified in our lives be glorified in our homes in our families be glorified at our workplaces be glorified in our businesses be glorified in this church god thank you for everyone who's chosen to come here today to worship you here in our midst may they receive your word today may we receive your word today thank you for everyone who is uh, able to join us online wherever they are god i pray that today you would speak to us holy spirit we pray that you'd capture our thoughts you'd replace your word in the place of our thoughts god we pray that our bodies our souls our hearts would be under your control freely move among us god we need you your word is life to us it is a light unto our path and so as you illuminate our mind illuminate our paths may we choose to walk in it for we belong to you god thank you thank you today be glorified here in our midst worship you god bless you in jesus name we pray amen can i hear a louder amen 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 good morning you may be seated welcome to the first sunday of um, august and um, what a joy it is to come together and today um, we gather here not only to worship our god but also to remind ourselves of the great sacrifice that was offered for us at the cross uh, not just on the first sunday of the month but every sunday we are supposed to do that but today gives us more uh, up in a better um, uh, it reminds us Uh, in a much better way as we partake in communion uh, of the great sacrifice of Christ for our lives and what a, a expression of grace cross is uh, in fact as i was thinking uh, a, uh, today's message as i wrote down today's message uh, i realized that it is such an appropriate uh, um, word today for us even as we come to celebrate the, uh, the uh, at the lord's table I'd like you to turn your bibles to Genesis chapter 50. We are in the middle of a series called Legacy. We're well almost at the end of the series called Legacy and we're talking about um you know what we leave behind as our legacy is very important. What we leave behind for the generations that come after us is very important. And I'd like to read a couple of verses from there um chapter 50 of Genesis and set the context for us for today's word. Um this is joseph talking to his brothers jacob just died brothers are worried that joseph would uh, exact revenge upon them um uh, probably they thought joseph was uh, until this point joseph is quiet because J- jacob is alive and so now that the father is dead they thought joseph is now going to take revenge on them and so they kind of sent a um, message to joseph saying uh, uh, would you spare us for the sin that we have committed against you um they came to to him prostrated themselves before him um in fact the the bible uses a word called they threw themselves in, in front of him um in an uh, in an act of utmost 
um, desperation, saying, you know, Joseph, if you don't spare us today, we'll be dead. So, uh, but jo- this is what Joseph said, and I think we should read that, verses uh, 19 onwards. Joseph replied, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for all, uh, intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so that I can save the lives of many people. So no, don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you and your children. So he reassured them by speaking kindly to them. As we talked about uh, what kind of legacy we need to leave behind, because what we leave behind not only affects how we live here on earth, not only affects our lives, but what we leave behind also affects the generations that will come after us, is how we started off this entire series. That was the premise of this, this series. Uh, what we leave behind is very important to us, to God and to the people who will come after us. And so we, we've been talking about what should we leave behind as a fruit, um, uh, as an inheritance for our children. One was uh, generosity. We talked about generosity being uh, a character that we need to leave behind uh, for our children. Faith as, um, as something that we need to leave behind as inheritance for our children. We talked about how selflessness is a character that we need to teach to our children so that they may learn to be selfless. Uh, and then last week we talked about honoring as a culture that we need to inculcate in our children. Uh, we talked about how we need to learn to teach, we need to teach them to honor the love of God, honor the law of God, honor the will of God um, in their lives. And today I want to talk about another, um, um, you know, part of inheritance that we need to leave behind for our children and that's, I want to call that grace. We need to teach our children to give grace generously. For that to happen, we must be people who give grace generously. What we see, what we heard right now, uh, Joseph uttering towards his brothers, is an example of how to show grace to people. Now, I know we have read the climatic words of Joseph's life, but uh, this entire uh, uh, you know, giving grace unfolds from chapter 42. From chapter 42, of Genesis to chapter 50 of Genesis is a story um, of uh, and a part of the story of Joseph's life which uh, shows us how to live a life full of grace and how to exhibit it through our lives and how it can actually impact the generations that will come after us. Joseph showed what grace looks like and how do you offer it. Well, when we think of Joseph's life, which we will think a little more next week too, um, as we conclude this entire series, um, the primary character that we we do see in Joseph's life as we begin uh, uh, the journey along with him from the time he was taken out of the uh, pit and um, was sent as a slave to Egypt and how God used his life in his ups and downs as uh, he helped Joseph to grow to this top position apart from Pharaoh. Joseph was the guy who was ruling the Egyptian kingdom, empire. Um, All through his journey towards leadership, the top leadership, Joseph exhibited one very important characteristic of a leader. Uh, It's called stewardship. We'll talk about how to make use of opportunities next week more. But, um, you know, he, he teaches us that, that very important quality as a leader. But as a person, as an individual, Joseph shows a, a different side of his, uh, his, 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 his character, which is grace. Chapter 42 begins the unfolding of grace side of Joseph. How he showed, um, how he dealt with his brothers how he showed kindness towards them. Um, Everything uh, kind of paints a picture of what a graceful life looks like. And if you choose to live with grace, how you would impact the generation that come after you. Joseph was sold into slavery when he was 17 years old. 
um, for the next 13 years, he spent as a slave in um, Egypt, both in uh, Potiphar's home and then in the prison, and then later on until the point that he was brought in front of Pharaoh in order to uh, reveal the dream that Pharaoh had and interpret that particular dream for Pharaoh. And that's how chapter 41 of Genesis ends. Um, when Pharaoh realizes this is, this is a guy who has the wisdom of God, this is a guy who sees God and who, um, who kind of, his life itself shows that there is a God who speaks and who lives. That's why, in fact, when um, Pharaoh appointed him as the king, as the uh, ruler of, uh, of uh, de facto ruler of Egypt, he named him a different name, uh, Zephanath Fania, uh, which means God speaks and lives. So Joseph's name was changed uh, as he was given this authority and now he is the guy who makes all the decisions in that kingdom. As Joseph uh, um, uh, you know, foretold what was going to happen over the next 14 years, 7 years of great uh, um, you know, crop and great fruit and then 7 years that follows after that uh, of, of uh, you know, a desperate drought that would come after that. For the first 7 years, Joseph managed to make sure uh, that um, all the, you know, the crops, the fruit that, that was brought forth uh, through the abundance were saved and, and uh, you know, managed well so that um, the entire nation is prepared for the seven years of drought. And that's where you'll find chapter 42 beginning. It was a severe famine. Not only it affected the land of Egypt, it aff it aff uh, the, the, the famine was all over the Middle East. So, Every nation that is in the Middle East was experiencing a severe famine. And of course it affected the family that was living in Canaan, Jacob's family and all the brothers that were living there. All of them were caught in the famine and Joseph, uh, J Jacob looks at his children and says, why don't you go to Egypt? We heard that there is, uh, there is food, uh, there is grains available in uh, Egypt. Uh, why don't you go there and purchase something for us so that our families can be saved? So you see that all the ten brothers take money and then travel all the way uh, to Egypt, find themselves standing in front of Joseph. And then as they stood there, you would begin to see how Joseph reacted from that moment shows um, uh, how God's grace functions, how we must learn to show grace to others. Let's go there and see what Joseph was experiencing there at that place. Since, uh, verses 6, 42, verses 6. Since Joseph was a governor of all Egypt and in charge of selling grain to all the people, it was to him that his brothers came. Now when they arrived, they bowed before him with their faces to the ground. Instantly, Joseph recognized his brothers instantly. But he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Remember these words, okay? He knew who was standing in front of him. They didn't know who he was uh, because obviously much time has passed. 17 years he was sold. Uh, uh, when he was 17 years, he was sold as a, a slave to Egypt. 13 years passed by. When he became the in charge of Egypt, he was 30 years old. That's what you would read in chapter 41. He was 30 years old. After he became the in charge of Egypt, seven years of great crop came in. That means seven years passed, he's 37. Then two years into famine, he's 39 now. 20 years, literally 20 years have gone by since they last saw Joseph. This young 17 year old teenager has now become a man, has his own children, has become the in charge of the entire country. Uh, he's a man who is now following a, what looks like a different culture, uh, even though he still worshiped the Lord. He still looks like an Egyptian to them. And they didn't recognize him. But he knew. He knew all of them. They caused great pain to him. How can he forget them? They are not people easily to be forgotten. We generally tend to forget those who do, did good for us. But we never forget those who did harm to us. It's just human nature. We keep their faces always in front of us. We remember them all the time. Maybe Joseph never forgot the people who harmed him. 
it, it is human to remember that. So he recognized them instantly. Their beards must have grown longer. Maybe they grayed more. Um, had bigger children now. 20 years. That's a long time. But he just didn't forget them. It's a very awkward moment to face. Joseph faced a very awkward moment. Because he's now at a place where he can exact revenge on them. From the land of Canaan, they replied when he asked them, where are you from? Not that he didn't know, but he purposefully asked them. And now the game begins. From the land of Canaan, they replied, we have come to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they didn't recognize him. Now, look at this, verses 9. And he remembered the dreams he had, he had had about them many years before. Now, the reason I read that verse is, I want to paint a picture of what Joseph is experiencing at that place. While he is standing in front of uh, these 10 uh, brothers who wronged him, who abused him, who caused a lot of pain to him, who had thrown his life into chaos, into a complete, complete uncertain future. These are the people who, because of whom he had to go through 17 years, 13 years of difficult uh, phase in his life. No one should go through what they, Joseph has gone through. Um, he was alone, separated from his family, uh, sent to a different country, a country with different culture, people who speak a language that is different from him. He's alone. Loneliness kills us, you know, when you're separated from your family, when you're separated from your friends. Uh, loneliness is not something that you can easily overcome. You can overcome a lot of difficult things in life. Um, you can overcome financial troubles. You can... You can um, work through difficult projects at the work. Um, but, but when you're lonely, that's a, that's a battle, a dif that's a different battle. It's, it's not something that, that, that can easily be overcome. 13 years of utter loneliness, even though he's in the middle of people, even though he's experiencing success in his work, he has gone through some success and failures. Um, he's alone. He's got nobody. The sense of being orphaned during a period of his life when um, he knew he's got a family but the sense of being rejected. It's not just that the family was taken away in some kind of natural disaster. They rejected him. His loneliness came because of a rejection from the family itself. It's a pain that nobody wants to go through. He had experienced that excruciating pain of being lonely for 13 years and now he stands at a place, 20 years later he stands at a place where he can exact revenge on them. Ten of them standing in front of him, bowing down, he even remembered what God had already told him 20 years ago in a dream that uh, your brothers would bow down to you. Now, look at this. He's got a reason to take revenge. He's got authority to take revenge. He can do that. He's, got, he's in a power right now. He's got an opportunity to take revenge. They don't know him. He can do whatever he wants with them. He may even feel God gave him this opportunity. Because he remembered the dream. There's a high possibility that if we face our enemies like this at a place like that and if we know that this is already foretold by God, you probably and I probably would think, man, God gave me my time. This is my time. I can do what I want here right now. Whatever I want to do right now. In awkward moments like that, where you lean in shows what your true character is. How you lean into that, those situations 
would show what God has done in your life, really done in, deep inside your heart. Joseph can take revenge at that place, but he decided to give grace to them. Remember this. He decided to give grace to them. He doesn't have to. He doesn't have to. Nobody would blame him if he took revenge on them. Nobody would blame him if he refused them. First of all, nobody would question if he does that because he is in a place of authority. He can do whatever he wants. He could simply say, uh, these are traitors, these are spies, just as he actually accused them of. He could do whatever he wants with them. But he decides at that place not to take revenge on them. It's a very pivotal moment, you know, when they stood in front of him. In awkward moments like that, these are not awkward moments, there are difficult moments, there are, that are uh, suffering, nothing. This is, this is a moment where you are in charge of your life. This is a moment where you can do whatever you want. This is a moment you feel like God given opportunity to exact revenge for the injustice that is done to you. And if you take revenge, it is still justifiable. Remember that. If you take revenge on those 10 people, it is still justifiable because you are right. But how you behave at that place, at that moment, Shows what you really made of of. Now he decides to show grace. And I wonder how many of us would actually do that when we face uh, people who wronged us, who hurt us, who physically abused us, emotionally abused us, who destroyed our future, who destroyed our family. How would you behave when you face them? and you have an opportunity to do something there. Every one of us would have those, those awkward moments. Um, we don't plan those moments. We can't plan them because when th those things happen, you feel like these are God-given moments to you. These are like, you can do this. You can do whatever you want right now. They will just happen. How you respond to those awkward moments says a lot about who you really are. That awkward reveals your character, your true heart, your values, what you care more about. So you can lean into those moments to show grace or lean away from those moments to exact revenge. Either way you would be right. But one would be God glories, glorious to God. Bring glory to God. Only one thing can do that. And Joseph chose to do what would bring glory to God. Offer grace. It is, um, it is incredible to begin to see what unfolds after this. That moment. The moment Joseph decided in his head, no, I'm not going to be like them. I'm going to be different. From that moment, how God entered into his life and changed everything after that. Not that God was not with him before. God was already with him before. Blessed everything Joseph did. You would see uh, from the time he was sold into slavery, you would see occasionally Bible specifically mentioning the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with everything that Joseph did. The Lord blessed everything Joseph did. Um, so the Lord was already with him, but then now God enters into his life and man changes everything. Not just Joseph's life, but he changes everybody who encountered Joseph from that moment. You see, the guy who went into the pit was an arrogant young lad. The guy who came out of the pit was a man who understood his enemy. He's nobody who, who understood this. I'm nobody. When he was sold into slavery, that's why he was able to serve with a great servant heart, wherever he was. Because he knew, my, you know, I'm nobody. I'm just glad God gave me an opportunity. We'll talk about it next week. I'm just glad I, God gave me an opportunity. Let me just do this. So he, he, he's a man who's experienced a particular transformation in the pit. His character changed into a servant heart. Now, 
when he is when he has all the authority he makes this magnanimous move to show grace to people and god lifted him into a different trajectory his life into a different trajectory um his life from that moment began to affect everybody he decided to show grace so you lean into an awkward moment by deciding not to take revenge but to extend grace now grace will never be appreciated unless the person who is receiving it recognizes it's a grace make the same, make you know let me explain what took place after that so he puts them in the prison calling them spies not because he wanted to exact revenge and i'll tell you as the story gets unfolded you begin to realize joseph did whatever joseph did he did it with a purpose in his head 3 days later he comes back to them and he says listen i'm a god fearing man i believe in god i believe to uh, i believe in following whatever god tells me to do whatever is right in the sight of god that's what i when he says i'm a god fearing man that's what he's saying i believe in the direction that god gives me so he looks at them and he says um i'll give you an opportunity to prove yourselves what he really is giving is an opportunity for them to build trust it was the trust that they broke at the pit brothers they were supposed to be brothers brothers who would take care of him youngest he was so as a youngest a uh, 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 younger brother he would look up to his elder brothers he would believe that these would come to my rescue these would stand behind me when i'm in trouble or with me when i am uh, uh, you know facing difficult periods he would they would be the ones who would uh, uh, become a protective wall when something some harm happens to me that was the trust he would have had as a younger brother as he looked up to his elder brothers but that's what they broke on that day trust so he looks at them and he says listen i'll give you an opportunity i'd like you to go back to your home bring some kind of proof in your younger brother you got another younger brother right benjamin uh, he he obviously they told that his, they got another brother benjamin told them why don't you get him until you come back i'm going to hold shimeon simeon as a, um, a prisoner here when you see joseph's acts you may feel Joseph is dealing them with harsh harshness but he was not i want you to understand that as you, as i told you as you begin to go through this entire story of joseph and how he dealt with his brothers you would see grace at work he held simeon back and sent them back to get benjamin because he wanted to see will these brothers who betrayed him before would betray simeon too would they come back again did they learn from their mistake what he is doing is giving them the opportunity to rebuild the trust that they have broken long ago 20 years ago um in the sinaitic desert when they put him in the in the pit and sold him into slavery to ishmaelite traders not caring about his life do you know what they did on that day the way they would have broken joseph's heart when they sold this boy to ishmaelite traders they sealed his fate the only thing that they avoided on that day is to have blood on their hands they didn't want to kill him because killing him would put blood on the blood on their hands so they decided if we give them to ishmaelite traders this fellow will never survive he's he's grown up too smooth you know at home he pampered too much by dad uh, this this fellow cannot survive harsh conditions like that he would die anyway in their in their hands at least a uh, blood won't come on our hands that was the brother's attitude i wish we would never have brothers like that but unfortunately we have brothers like that in our lives who would think like that behave like that and would do exactly uh, what these brothers did to joseph to us too broke our break our trust betray us uh when we expect them to stand with us and so joseph decides i'll give you an opportunity to show me that you're trustworthy 
grace works once uh, uh, the trust gets rebuilt slowly what he did is he made a way for trust to be built as he sent them away he was testing their character testing their love for the brother now now forgiveness can be immediate i'll talk about forgiveness a little later forgiveness can be immediate but trust takes time forgiveness is free you know but trust has to be earned small steps towards stronger trust joseph is giving them chance to take small steps towards trust he created a pathway for them to trust you know build their trust uh, his trust in them at least when a trust is broken naturally wall gets up you know we build walls around us it's it's natural that many of us when we experience betrayal when we experience um, un 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 thought uh, you know hurts caused by people we love the most or we trusted the most it becomes uh, uh, unimagined not unthought unimagined we, we it's natural that we build walls and it's 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 justifiable that we build walls around ourselves and say never going to trust people I'm never going to put my my life in somebody else's hand never going to put anything in others hands it's natural for us to think like that but the thing about joseph as i looked at joseph and i i realized that that's what god expects us to do is that instead of uh, building uh, walls around us m- maybe a graceful life like joseph's uh, would teach us maybe instead of walls can we start building bridges giving an opportunity for people to walk back to us to come back and earn our trust again maybe well that's what uh, joseph did that's what jesus did too jesus did too now if we, if we, you know it's 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 okay if, if if you sit there and say listen pastor i like what you're saying but really when i do this people don't know their boundaries um i'd like to do that but you know sometimes people just walk all over me um now bridges have boundaries too i understand that being walked upon getting hurt has 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 has, has hurt you so much that you're not really sure whether i can suffer this long or more now but that's what we do with jesus too all the time that the more opportunities god keeps giving us the more we walk all over him in our disobedience with our bitterness with our unforgiving hearts uh, uh, with uh, with our deception we keep breaking god's heart um but god never put a wall up he did everything in his uh, in his divine capacity to bring down all the walls that would stop us from approaching him making sure that there is a permanent way for us through christ to approach him confidently any time we want right didn't he do that isn't that's what we're celebrating this morning so as people who earned uh, at least who who received an opportunity to earn our uh, you know our way back trust uh, don't you think we should also be people who would be kind enough to extend the same thing to those who hurt us and joseph did that he gave an opportunity for his brothers to build um to their trust to build a trust in them 
and brother, brothers, those brothers responded well. They went back to the father. By the time you, you come to uh, chapter 43, you would see um, that all of them realized the terrible thing that's happening to them is a punishment from God. It's not actually a punishment from God, actually. At that moment, when they saw what was happening to them, they may fe- they, they, it's natural that they would feel it's a punishment from God. And that's what they said. You know, the reason we are going through all this is because of what we did to Joseph. They must have remembered Joseph because they came to Egypt. In fact, they were standing in front of Joseph and discussing exactly that. Saying, all this is happening because of what we did to Joseph. Joseph could understand them. They didn't know Joseph could understand them. They were talking among themselves and saying, and Reuben looked at them and said, didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you for what we do to Joseph, we're going to one day suffer like this? And God is punishing us. When we go through seasons like that, we also may feel that God is punishing us in case we are the ones who hurt others. But actually God was giving grace to those 10 brothers. It was an opportunity God gave to them through Joseph to change. And that's my third point. What Joseph did is he made room for people to change. Give them this time. Go. Let me see. Would you take responsibility for what you have done? Would you take a responsibility for what you are asking, you've been asked to do now? So they go back home, tell Jacob what happened. Jacob is even more heartbroken. He, he must have lived in pain, you know. The brothers thought when they hurt Joseph, only Joseph gets hurt. Well, the thing is this, when you hurt somebody, not just that person, but everything that is connected to that person gets hurt too. We may not realize that most of the time when we hurt others. When they hurt Joseph, they thought, good riddance of Joseph. But they go back home. For 20 years, they're reminded of what they have done to Joseph as they look at Jacob. This old man, as he grew older, would grieve for a son that he lost. The one he loved the most. And so obviously every day they must have seen uh, Jacob going through that pain of losing a son that he dearly loved. And I'm sure every single one of them felt guilty over what they have done. Unable to do anything about it. Now they are thrown into more, more chaos. At least looks like what, 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 what looks like a more chaos when Joseph had uh, uh, held Simon as, uh, Simeon as a, as a prisoner and asked them to get Benjamin. Um, goes back, they tell the father. Father actually worded it in his own words, saying, would you want to send this grieving white beard man, white haired man into his grave by taking Benjamin also away from me? I'm sure that, 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 that the drama there uh, was really, really emotional. Brothers didn't know what to do now. They feel responsible for Joseph. They feel now responsible for Simeon. They also feel responsible for the, for, for the father who's grieving there. And they know that the only way to correct it is to do what Joseph asked them to do. Uh, 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 um, but if they take Benjamin, they don't know whether it's going to come back. He's going to come back or not. They're in a very strange predicament at that place. Uh, So father, because he said, I'm not going to let Benjamin go from here. They stayed back. They didn't know what to do. Simeon is still in the prison. Remember this. Simeon is still in the prison. I don't know how long it took. But all the uh, grains that were brought also finished. They have now another problem with this. That when they were going back, Joseph made sure that along with the grains, they put the money back in the sack. 
So they got another problem here. That when they reached, they opened the sacks, they saw the money that they prayed for grains was kept back. Now it's a question of integrity. What Joseph did is two tests with his brothers. A test of integrity. Will these fellows come back and say, listen, we got our money back. We don't want this money. Will these fellows come back and show responsibility? Two tests. They didn't know that. They thought, oh my God, we're in more trouble now. Uh, so, they can't go back with, without Benjamin. Um, they want to go back and say, you know, we got the money back, we should return it back to you. They want to do that, even if they want to show their integrity. Because they kept saying, we are honest men, we are not spies, right? They kept claiming, we have always been honest. And Joseph is saying, show me your honesty. And now they can't go back with, without Benjamin and father won't send. They're stuck until one of them stands up and says, listen dad, I will take responsibility. That's the change process. Judah walks up to dad and says, dad, I should have been there for Joseph. I am not there. Now I'll be there for Benjamin. It's my responsibility to bring Benjamin back. If I cannot bring Benjamin and Simeon back, take my children and kill them, my two sons and kill them. Judah said, this is a man who now recognizes what's past is past. I want to take responsibility for the present. That's how change begins in life. What's gone is gone. There's nothing I can do about it. I can't change that. But now, I'm given an opportunity to take responsibility. I'm going to take up the responsibility. So he took up the responsibility. He says, Dad, please send. Otherwise, all of us would die. I am willing to sacrifice my two children in order to make sure this thing happens. He should have done that 20 years ago. He didn't do that. Now, at least, he's doing it. I wonder why God always chose Judah to be the tribe that he came from. The tribe of Judah, from the beginning, because of Judah, I guess, exhibits the first person to take up the responsibility for what's been wrong in the family. So he takes up the responsibility and takes Benjamin along with him, comes. Joseph is very happy. He throws a party. Um, they didn't understand why he's throwing the party, but at least they're glad that this guy is throwing a party and they enjoy the party there. And when they uh, are returning back, Joseph sends them back with double of what they brought. They brought the money back, by the way. When they brought the money back, they went straight to the manager and said, listen, um, 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 you know, the, you, maybe some of you guys did, your accountant did a mistake. They put the money back into our account. Uh, so we are here to return. And that guy says, no, I don't know what you're talking about. Your God must have given your money back because the money in my accounts are done. Clear. Which means Joseph paid for them. Remember that. That's what it means. Joseph paid already for his brothers. The brothers may not know that. These are all simple points that you need to remember. So Joseph pays for them, now throws a party, pays money for this time too. In fact, he pays extra money back to them, sends them back. One final test he wants to do to see if these people really changed. So he puts a silver cup in, in Benjamin's bag, sack, as they're on the way back, sends uh, his officers behind them, accusing them of stealing Joseph's silverware. And before they could search, one of them spoke up too soon and said, listen, if you find, we are too honest, we are honest men. You saw how we got the money back, right? We are honest, if you, if you find that silverware in any one of our bags, that person would become your slave. I don't know why they always think of slavery. <laughs> to spoke too, too soon. And the manager knew. 
this guy is dead now. So he said, okay, I'll bind you for your word. And to their horror, it was in Benjamin's sack. And imagine the horror the ten would have felt at that moment. The sinking feeling that they've experienced. Bible actually describes that. They sunk in their heart. Their hearts sank. They knew this is it. With this one act, not only they kill Benjamin, they kill their father too. Remember that. All ten of them instantly realized, not only we lose Benjamin here, we lose the father too. Their hearts, hearts sank. And so they say again, God is punishing us for what we have done to Joseph. This is exactly what they said. Chapter 44 now. We are in chapter 44. Uh, God is punishing us for what we have done to Joseph. Now, now what took place after that is the most important thing. That showed Joseph that these fellows changed. Benjamin, uh, uh, Judah stepped forward. You remember just like how he took responsibility there. Judah stepped forward, spoke on behalf of everybody. And said, you can't take any one of us as a slave. You can take me as your slave. Leave my brother alone. I guess that's what happens when we give people an opportunity to make change in their lives. People will change. Remember that. But all of this will start with the day you decide not to take revenge and decide, I'll give grace to these people. Because Joseph decided, I would uh, lean in during this awkward moment. I will not, cha- I'll not exact revenge. I will show grace to these people. Because he leaned into that, all the ten brothers are now being transformed. Something is happening in their life. They are changing. So when um, Judah stands up, he still lies, by the way, as he recounts the story. But at least he shows remorse to what he has done. Joseph could see through. Joseph knows the, knows the story, right? Uh, you know, my, my father loves this kid very much. And, and he already lost one of his sons. That son would have been eaten by wild animals. Um, um, maybe he thought Joseph doesn't know the story. <laughs> so he's telling Joseph... Uh, my, I had another brother, Joseph, who was killed by wild animals and my father is already heartbroken over him. Uh, I, I, you know, I cannot let my father go through this again. Um, and so as he's talking, Joseph's heart was broken. Actually, Joseph's heart broke three times by this time. Don't think that this is the only place Joseph felt bad for his brothers. He actually felt bad for his brothers right in the beginning itself. His heart broke when he saw them standing in front of them. His heart broke when he saw Benjamin for the first time. Bible talks about how he couldn't hide his tears anymore and he ran into his washroom and cried there and then cleaned his face, came back to sit with them at the dining table. Um, All this while, Joseph wanted to tell that I am Joseph, but, but waiting for the trust to be rebuilt. Waiting for the trust to be rebuilt. Waiting to see a change in the lives of people who hurt him. Not that he wants to, he he cannot forgive them beforehand. but, But he decided, I need to see them change. And then I can offer forgiveness. So once he saw all these ten brothers who came forward to say, I'd like to, I'd like to take the responsibility for, for Benjamin. Instead of Benjamin, can you take us? took 20 years for people to change. But people do change when you make room for them to change. Then Joseph offers forgiveness. Wait a second. Isn't he supposed to offer forgiveness right in the beginning? He didn't. Do you see that? Leaning into... Showing grace is different from actually offering forgiveness. 
I want you to understand this. It's much different. Forgiveness would never be appreciated until the person who's receiving the forgiveness actually knows that he is the perpetrator. Actually knows and understands that he deserves to be punished. Actually comes to a place where he says, Oh my God, what have I done? And you would see that unfolding in chapter 45. So Joseph couldn't hold him, hold, this, hold, hold his emotions anymore. So he reveals his identity. He says, I'm Joseph, verses 3. I'm Joseph. He couldn't, he, couldn't, he couldn't stop himself anymore. He said to his brothers, is my father still alive? His words still did not sink into their heads. Okay? He, the Bible says they're completely speechless, which simply means uh, they had this amygdala hijack. Uh, for some uh, unlearned people, it, it simply means you're paralyzed. You're like, oh my God, what's happening here? Yeah? The, the panic is setting in. Fear is setting in. Realization is setting in. They, 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 they're still letting that word, I'm Joseph, how, how is my father, sinking into their head. And as it began to sink into their head, they realized, we are dead. We are dead now. They realized, uh, this is the moment they realized, this is the revenge moment. You see, the revenge moment came two chapters before. For, for Joseph, as he saw brothers and realized, ah, this is my moment. But, 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 but brothers now understood, this is the moment he can take revenge on us. He now, they now realize, oh, we are dead. But look at Joseph as he speaks to them. And Joseph again told them, come closer. And he said, as they came closer, he said to them, I'm Joseph, your brother. The one you sold into slavery in Egypt. But don't be upset. It sounds soothing for us when we say that, but I, it never got into their head, by the way. They're still fear-filled. Don't be, up, don't be upset. Don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me ahead of you to preserve your lives. Now when you read those words, don't think Joseph is simply saying, it's okay, no problem. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying that. He's not just bypassing all the 20 years of pain. That's not what he's doing. Remember that. When he's saying, he's reminding them what they did to him. Remember that. He told them, I'm your brother, you sold me into slavery. But he's not brushing the pain away. When he's saying what he's saying right now, don't be upset with yourselves. Don't be afraid that you sold me into slavery. God did something in my life because of what you have done. Ha! Huh. That's when I understood how can we also offer forgiveness to people who hurt us that deeply. We can offer forgiveness to people who hurt us that deeply when we begin to see what God did during that season of hurt to us. Joseph is looking at them and he's saying, the reason he was able to, what looks like a brush off of what their, what their uh, crime is because Joseph decided, I'm not looking at the crime, I'm going to look at what God did when they committed that crime against me. You tried to hurt me and kill me, but God used that to preserve me. He preserved me so that I can preserve you. Look at that. Look at what he's saying. God preserved me so that I can preserve your lives. So don't be afraid. 
It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. This famine that ravaged this land for two years will last for five more years. That's why I told you he's 39 years old. Seven plus two. And there will be neither plowing nor harvesting now. Look at what he's saying. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many survivors. So it was God who sent me here, not you. He is the one who made me the advisor to Pharaoh. He is the one who made me the manager of this entire place and the governor of all Egypt. What Joseph decided to look at is how God preserved his life when the brothers tried to kill his life. Not only God preserved his life, God sustained him in Egypt in all his ups and downs from slavery in Potiphar's house hold to house manager in Potiphar's house to a prisoner in a falsely accused and thrown into the prison with no future and to become the head of the prison itself and then with, uh, no, with an uncertain future ahead of him, had this opportunity to have this chance encounter, which of course is orchestrated by God, with two people who then later on become a cause for him to enter into Pharaoh's palace. All this while, the sustenance came from God. Joseph knew all this up and down, up and down, up and down. God is taking care of me during this season. So you see this. Brothers want to kill him, God preserves him. God sustains him and God promotes him. And so he decides, now that God has shown me so much grace, so what he says looks like a brush off. But it's not a brush off. It's a, it's a man who was really hurt. But he's a man who's deciding, no, I'm not going to look at the crime. I'm going to look at this promotion God gave me. And now realize that this promotion has a purpose. In fact, it is to save these very people who tried to hurt me. So when he made room for people, he had the chance to forgive and he could only forgive them because he chose to look at God. Why, why did I give so much explanation? It's because forgiveness isn't a feeling. You'll never feel good enough to forgive people. None of us would ever be in a place where we are feeling good enough to say, it's okay. We'll never be. Because if you are waiting for good feeling to forgive somebody, you will wait all your life and you'll go into grave with that. You'll never be able to forgive people. If you're waiting for a good, good feeling, forgiveness is a choice. It's a choice that you decide and make, say, let me offer it. The only way to come to that place of making that choice in spite of opposite feelings is to learn to look at God and see what God has done to you when people hurt you. Now when I began, I told you right in the beginning um, that grace. All this began at the moment where he decided to show grace. But from grace to forgiveness, there's a long gap. Did you see that? God works like this exactly. I've realized this as I began to prepare for this sermon. I realized that Genesis chapter 42 to chapter 50 is the exhibition of God's heart. Actually, what God is doing in this world and with us, even before the foundations of the earth were laid down. Paul talks about it, how God looked at all of us, even before the foundations of the earth were laid down. That means, even before God created the heavens and the earth, He saw you and me, and He knew that we were going to break His heart. That we would rebel against Him. That we would be people who would betray Him time and again, would trample all over him. 
all over his uh, we'd mess up his entire creation would mess up his plan and purpose for our lives for others lives we would be evil filled with evil and wickedness he knew it he already foresaw it even before he created anything at all but then at the beginning even before he created he decides i'll show grace i'll show grace to these people there's nothing that we did to deserve to receive that grace but god says i'll give grace to these people he has not yet created us but he decides i'll give grace now for them to understand grace something has to happen in order to show how his grace works he sends his son to come to this world take human form and take the punishment that we deserve upon himself so this innocent blood that was shed for our sin makes a path for us to receive forgiveness makes room for us to change makes room for us to rebuild the trust god is making room for us to earn his trust again god is making room for us to change to take responsibility for what we have done and to, to come to that place you see the brothers who were standing in front of joseph knew fully well now at that moment knew fully well they deserve punishment prior to that in those two chapters you would see the two times he put the money back or the or the a cup back into the sack they all of them were talking about unfairness we are honest people how can you deal with us like this remember that they were talking about their own honesty their own self righteousness now they stand here after he revealed himself they stand there fully realizing no nah. we are supposed to receive punishment right now if joseph punished them i don't think anybody would have complained i don't think anybody would have ob- uh, objected to that they would know fully well they know that they deserve to be punished at that moment they are now uh, completely undeserving to receive punish, uh, 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 for, uh, forgiveness and grace joseph extends grace to them and pun- uh, uh, forgiveness to them exactly what god did at the cross at the cross when you come to the cross you would, you know you and i know fully well that we deserve punishment that you know you can't expect god to show grace to you you know that you don't deserve for god to show grace to you you know you don't even deserve forgiveness in fact you deserve punishment you would not even complain about the punishment that you would be receiving should god decide to punish you at that moment you are truly repentant that's why forgiveness at the cross works because you really recognized your failure utter failure and you recognized you don't deserve to be forgiven at all and then you say jesus i got no other option but you and then god says i'll forgive you now so now remember the forgiveness does not mean reconciliation it did not happen till okay remember that grace and forgiveness there's a gap god shows grace but you still need to come to a place where you recognize you are worthy of punishment you have to come to that place in order to appreciate forgiveness once you begin to appreciate forgiveness then now there is an opportunity for reconciliation now there is an opportunity for you to get back into the family of god forgiveness does not automatically make you like christ it doesn't make you like christ from that moment you have to now start rebuilding your relationship with christ so that's what god is doing right now with all of us till christ comes back or till we are called home to be with christ what the holy spirit is doing right now in our lives is what we call a sanctification process he is reconstructing us reconciling us to the father 
so that we can get back into the original form that we were in. So, restoration will follow only after forgiveness. Restoration of relationships don't happen the moment I say I forgive you or you say you forgive me. It doesn't happen like that. Restoration is a two-way process. Both needs to consciously work towards rebuilding relationship. Forgiveness is offered, but restoration has to take action. Both parties need to work together. What Joseph is now saying is, I no longer hold this against you. I'm giving you a choice to rebuild your trust with me and rebuild your relationship with me. I've done everything that I can to show that I forgive you. In fact, Joseph did not stop there. He took one more step to show them that he actually forgave them and that is this, that he chose to bless them. Not only he verbalized, by, you know, he, he verbally said, God preserved me so that I can preserve you. He did not just simply say that. What followed after that is the act of preservation of their lives. He says, now go back, get dad. Once you bring dad, I will take you to Pharaoh. I'll make sure you will have a land where you can, all of you, all your families can settle down. He's not just looking for father, look at this. He's saying, I know you guys wronged me, but I will give you an opportunity to settle down. I'll bring you back. I'll allot a place called Goshan for you. Even before Pharaoh allocated it, Joseph already allocated it for them. He said, I'll put you in the best of Egypt, best positions in this place. I'll give you that. And I'll make sure you, your children, will have enough to settle down. This is a man who's taking extra mile. Maybe that's what Jesus meant in Luke chapter 6 when he said, love your enemies. Do good to them, to those who hurt you. Bless those who curse you. Maybe that's what it means. Joseph decided I'd forgive you and I would bless you now. And he, he did that. When they came back with the father and with all these uh, uh, 70 families gathered along with Joseph's family, it's 70 families now. All of them came back together, 70 people. All of them came together. Joseph took them to Pharaoh. Joseph even trained them how to talk to Pharaoh. You know, before they went there. This is, guy, this is a guy who's going extra mile to show grace to his brothers who hurt him. Forgive, we think forgiveness is enough. But this guy says, no, 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 I'll not stop there. I'll become a blessing to them. He actually became a blessing to them. Trained them how to talk to Pharaoh. Made sure Pharaoh actually allocated Goshen for them. All of them settled down there. Same brothers. You know, he showed that when he kissed them. By the time you come to Genesis chapter 45, this is what's happening, right? As he revealed himself, as he showed extra kindness to them, the Bible talks about how he hugged them in verses 15 and kissed them. In, the, in that culture, when you kiss somebody, hold them, hug them and kiss somebody, you're saying, I'm ready to make a relationship with you. What, in other words, he's doing is to his brother saying, past is gone. I'm choosing to rebuild my relationship with you. Fresh start, new relationship. And he did that freely. That's why Bible says, after this, the brothers began to talk freely to him. Now they know, this brother completely forgive me. Do they deserve it or not? They already know. But now they know this brother gave me forgiveness. So I can talk to him freely. That's how grace changes people. He blessed them. Brought his dad back. And settled them after his father died. They came to him again worried that he might reverse that. So he's talking to them and he's saying, no, 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 I'm not like that. I'm not a God. 
God brought me here so that I can be a blessing to you. What he said at that place, chapter 50, and how it concludes, I love it. When he looked at, looked at them and said, don't be afraid. No, don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you. Just because father was there, don't think I showed kindness to you as long as father is there. Even now, when the father is not there, I'll still show kindness to you. I will still take care of you and your children. So he reassured them by speaking kindly to them. This whole drama began with Joseph speaking harshly to them. Chapter 42. When they first met him, he spoke harshly to them. And grace, man, the way grace concludes things, he spoke kindly to them. Joseph should teach us how to live a graceful life. And what happens when you show grace like this? You know, you may look at this entire plot, um, plot line and think it, it was Joseph's story all along. But actually, it was Jacob's story all along. You see, more than Joseph, Jacob suffered. When he stood in front of Pharaoh and what he said in front of Pharaoh tells us how much suffering father had gone through. Says, uh, Joseph, uh, Pharaoh asks him, how old are you? And Jacob looks at him and says, I'm 130 years old. But my life was filled with hardship. He is this father who had experienced rejection all his life. He is this father who had fought his battles all alone, always. Wasn't Jacob a lone fighter all his life? He's always been the guy who's on the run. He's always been the guy who never got what he really wanted. Jacob suffered a lot in his life. He watched his only daughter being raped by an entire group of people. Couldn't do nothing. He knew what pain looks like. And then, finally, his favorite wife gives birth to a son who he really wanted to, you know, love. And uh, probably, when he, he must be 93 years old when he got Joseph. Uh, because he's 130, which simply means he must be 93 when he had Joseph. Or 91 or 92, whatever. This is a son he got in his old age. And he was waiting for this son. All along. Longed for this son. He got his son. The son was snatched away from him. For the next 20 years, in his head, Joseph is dead. All through this journey, don't you think Joseph, jo Jacob, the master deceiver, right? Don't you think he knew brothers did something? Father knew the brothers did something. Father is smart enough, you know. He's, he's, he's a, he conquered the world without anybody's help. So he knew what his brothers would have done. Something. They would have done something to brother. That, that much he knew. But he chose to let them live. All this while, 20 years. The Bible uses this word when he saw Joseph, his spirits came back. Spirits. All 20 years of complete des you know, depression just got lifted up like that. The moment he saw Joseph, spirits were revived for the first time in his entire life. At 130 years, father is now truly joyful as he saw Joseph. That moment would never have taken place if Joseph did not lean into grace. That 130 year old father would never have experienced joy if Joseph decided, I'll take revenge. Think of those things. That's why leaning into grace is very critical for Christians, for us, 
those who have experienced that grace but i love what jo- jacob did he he's a man who showed grace who understood grace showed grace at the end by the time you come to chapter 49 before he died he called the 10 10 10 brothers made them stand laid his hand on each one of them and blessed them wholeheartedly according to their measure bible says jacob blessed them what a father he is no wonder joseph is a man of grace because he he know his father knows his father how can you and i call ourselves christians and partake in what what is the most uh, clear evidence of of grace and never show grace to others we should have that dna inside us right when we came to christ joseph showed that grace because of jacob and because joseph showed grace father looks at him and says listen I, in my mind i already lost you <laughs> so here is what i'm going to do i'll take your two child children as my my sons ephraim and manasseh your children right bring them to me and he places his hands upon both of them and gives them a blessing do you know what joseph is in fact receiving a double portion of anointing a double portion of blessing joseph is receiving that because he showed grace two portions of blessing all the 10 of them got their portions that's how chapter 49 ends each one according to their proportion they got blessing joseph got double he's not even the eldest one but showed grace so he received double because of him his children got blessed this is the legacy we want to leave behind with our lives are we be people who show grace extra grace so that not only we enjoy our life we receive grace from god but our children can be blessed after us may god help us to show grace remind yourselves of the grace of god that you have experienced personally in your own life